world's greatest superheroes. Strong, noble men and women, vanquishing evil while defending liberty and freedom. And most of them are American. For over 70 years, Canada has had a legion of its own superheroes who have entertained generations of comic book fans. Today, most of them are largely forgotten, and it's almost impossible to find anyone who's ever heard of them. If anybody here feels like they're in trouble, I will protect you. My favorite superhero, I, I like The Flash. He's got a little cocky attitude, and uh, he's a little underrated, but I think he, he does a great job. I know a lot of people say this, but probably be Batman. I really like Green Lantern, Aquaman, or Thor. I'm pretty boring, I'm Superman, pretty straightforward. I can't help it. Iron Man, <laughs> Iron Man, he's my secret crush. He's awesome, I love Tony Stark. Who doesn't want Tony Stark as her secret crush? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, who's your favorite Canadian superhero? My favorite? Oh. Um, mm. I guess that would have to be Wolverine. Oh, yeah, I know Wolverine's in Canada. We know that much. Is there more besides Wolverine? And then there's uh, the, the Sasquatch guy. They have that whole team. We're getting into Alpha Flight here. That's the one where the one guy's gay, right? No, I think one of them's a midget. Can you give us some multiple choice? Yeah. Well, I like that they do right. Does that count? It's funny how they, they usually fight crime down in the States. I guess Canada's already got, they you got know, the crime, crime cover. Yeah. I don't know any Canadian, I don't know any Canadian superheroes. <laughs> Maybe one of them was gay. I think briefly in like the 90s one was gay. Well, one of them was husband and wife, I it remember that. It was a passing thing. Yeah. yeah. It was college. He was super gay. He was experimenting, yeah. Super gay, now he's a midget. I, he can't be gay and Canadian, that's like a double whammy. <laughs> <laughs> Canadians are a product of our remote geography, our harsh climate, and our unspectacular history. In the beginning, we were a hardy people, loggers, trappers, and frontier settlers. Today, we're known for our arts and culture and have turned out some of the brightest talent in show business. We don't start wars, we finish them. And while our real life Canadian heroes tend to be bland, obscure, and dead, at least they're our heroes. Even though Toronto native Joe Schuster co-created Superman and modeled the Daily Planet on the Toronto Daily Star newspaper where he once worked, most of us wouldn't realize that Superman exists in part because of a Canadian. It'll never fly. Why, no. But he can leap over tall buildings. In typical Canadian fashion, we even made a public service announcement to remind ourselves Superman was one of our own. Take it, it's a gift. You never know, it might be worth something someday. Even with our own homegrown superheroes, more often than not, we adopt the more popular ones from next door. Over the years, sustaining a Canadian superhero has remained stubbornly elusive. So, are we a nation who resists the idea of heroes? Or worse, a nation of no heroes? But it wasn't always like this. Over the past 70 years, we've had Brock Windsor, Nelvana of the Northern Lights, Captain Canuck, Alpha Flight, and many others. But all of them have struggled to find mainstream success in Canada. It's as if we don't want our own superheroes and are content to love America's. As Prime Minister Trudeau famously said, we are next to a sleeping elephant affected by every twitch and grunt. Even today, Making a bona fide Canadian comic book superhero is harder than it seems, but it wasn't always this way. We once had a golden age of Canadian superheroes. It took a world war to make it happen. In the 1930s, Canada had the same problems we have today. We have a large, unprotected border. There's a large influx of literature and media from the States. But one of the things that was a very American contribution to that was comic books. Comic books were a mass medium. 
virtually every child who could get them read comics, boys and girls. And every comic sold represented who knows how many readers. It was like crack cocaine for kids. I mean, it's got explosions, it's color, it's something they could roll up and collect. Basically, kids don't have any money, so comics would sort of serve the whole street. A kid had a dime, he could go in and get a comic, his friend could go in and get a comic, and that comic would go all around the block several times. It would be, you know, ripped apart and rolled up and carried around with them. It was kind of a world that kids owned. What you have to remember is that the comic book is a very new medium at this point, and the superhero is even newer. Superman was only created in 1938. But virtually overnight, it becomes a huge part of the media landscape, and especially uh, for children. This is the first medium that kids can afford to buy for themselves. And that's just tremendously important. They have control and can make their own choices. And by and large, what they choose is superheroes. On September 1st, 1939, everything changed when Hitler invaded Poland and the Second World War began. Across Canada, people rallied behind their nation and the British Empire. Recruiting stations popped up as brave young men signed up for war. Children cheered the troops as they set off for Europe. With the nation at war, the government was concerned with saving hard currency and crucial resources that were desperately needed to fund the war effort. With the passing of the War Exchange Conservation Act in 1940, the government banned the importing of selected non-essential items from the United States. Overnight, Canadians could no longer buy American perfume, pulp novels, greeting cards, and comic books. Suddenly there was a great big hole in the hearts of children across the country. This, this, this fix of explosive color and heroic action and, and comedy and stuff was suddenly gone. So it was only natural that some enterprising companies would come in and try to fill that gap. In the absence of American comics, Canadian companies like Maple Leaf, Educational projects, Bell Features, and Anglo-American stepped in to fill the void. Mostly drawn in black and white to save costs, these new comics would eventually become known as the Canadian Whites. And with them, Canadians could once again read superhero stories. Except now, they would be our own. When you were a kid in the late 30s and early 40s, the world surrounded Superman and Batman. That was kid culture because they didn't have television and radio for themselves. And when that went away, it must have felt a little bit like your childhood went away. So when the Canadian Whites started up, it was like childhood coming back. I can't imagine what that was like. The thing about Canadian Whites is the first time you run across a Canadian White, you're really struck by the fact that, well, as the name suggests, it is essentially without the red color. It's all in black and white. And there's a real charm to them. There's a real clunkiness, but a real charm. And it's not the kind of charm that you can kind of replicate. And you can see that they, the storytelling is not very good. The panel to panel layout is not very good. But the actual physical drawing is very, very good. Because a lot of these guys were very solid, very good illustrators. And to be honest, there's just something about these comics, just holding them now. The paper feels like linen. There's a real tactile quality to them. And you're looking at history. When you pick up one of these, you think, that's really cool. <laughs> the thing that excites me most about them is that they're as beautifully drawn as any other comic. They're as nice as an American one, as nice as a, as a British one, as nice as a Puerto Rican one, but they're ours. No one else got to see them but us. And so to a little kid growing up in 1942, it must have been the same thrill that I got when I was little reading Captain Canuck, knowing that this was just ours. This was the local guy. This was the guy you'd see down at your, your local Legion Hall fighting crime. And when, when Canada, which is the world's largest small town, realizes that it has its own culture, it's when it's most fun to be Canadian. Maple Leaf is probably of all the companies throughout the war, is probably one of the ones with the most consistent quality to what they did. They had an excellent array of artists. They were surprisingly consistent with having those same artists working throughout their four or five years of life. And they seemed to come from, especially early on, a very British tradition, a very stiff upper lip feel to a bunch of their characters. Very clever plotting and a very consistent product. So. Maple Leafs were kind of the class of the field. 
The first book published by Maple Leaf was Better Comics, and it featured probably the first what we would call official Canadian superhero, Iron Man. No relation. Created by Vernon Miller, Iron Man is widely considered to be Canada's first true national superhero. An acclaimed Vancouver newspaper artist, Vernon Miller, wanted to put his drawing talents to use, helping the war effort, which led him to the creation of Iron Man. Despite murky origins under the sea, Iron Man predated Aquaman by several months and went on to have a successful career fighting Nazis and villains on behalf of Canada. Iron Man was basically an incredible physical specimen who lived in a dome city under the sea. And when a World War II battle sort of waged on the ocean above his city and he found himself embroiled in it, he began to fight for the Allies against the Nazis, leaping through the sky, punching planes out of the air and sinking submarines and basically going on adventures. Nobody really knows why the character was called Iron Man because he didn't do irony things. He, he didn't lift iron or have iron-like skin or anything like that. But I think it's probably because the term Iron Man has always been a term for someone who's tough. Ultimately, Iron Man was a pretty basic superhero. He flies, he's strong, pretty much no personality. Check, check, check. But he was first, so we need to honor him. One of Maple Leaf's best-known artists, John Stables, created the giant-sized Canadian superhero named Brock Windsor. Often traveling by canoe from a remote corner of the north, Brock Windsor immediately became one of Canada's most popular superheroes. A mix of science, fiction, fantasy, and action-adventure, Brock Windsor was grounded in sound Canadian principles like honor and loyalty, and was distinctly connected to the landscape. After having a number of sci-fi adventures, when he eventually came back, he shrank back to his normal size, but retained his gigantic strengths. And they began to make his adventures be more of the real world variety, but still very super heroic. Canada's answer to Batman, Cosmo Grant, was an inventive superhero who relied on his smarts and numerous gadgets to defeat his enemies. Created by Spike Brown and featured in Rocket Comics, Cosmo used a variety of his own scientific inventions for the betterment of humanity and fought evil with the help of his good friend, Hoot Hayden. We think that Batman named everything Bat something, but Cosmo, you know, his plane was made out of Cosmolite. He had a Cosmo gun and everything had Cosmo in front of it just because this guy knew about trademarking long before anybody else. Initially dominating the market, Maple Leaf Comics soon faced stiff competition when newcomer Anglo-American appeared on the scene. Led by publishers Harold Sinnott and Ted McCall and artist Ed Furness, Anglo-American gained quick prominence by republishing their popular newspaper comic strips in book form. There were a number of these adventures before Anglo-American did something unique to all the other companies. They signed a deal with Fawcett the producers of Captain Marvel in the States, whereby, as opposed to reprinting Fawcett Adventures, Anglo-American would get the scripts that Fawcett had used for their books and redraw them in Canada and show them as new adventures. They were literally Canadian versions of those stories. And that did pretty well for them for a few years. The unique deal with Fawcett Publications eventually ran out and Anglo-American was forced to begin publishing their own original characters, one of which was an international adventurer named Commander Steel. Commander Steel was a swashbuckling and patriotic crime fighter who sought out villainous Nazis wherever he could find them. He was a powerful young man who worked for an international police force who bullets could burst off of. He had the energy and strength of, you know, a dozen men. And he went from country to country, righting wrongs and fighting evil. Created by Ed Furness and Ted McCall, one of the most successful Anglo-American characters was Freelance, a thrill-seeking hero who fought villains and protected the innocent at home and abroad. 
Trained to maximize his physical and athletic skills, Freelance was the ultimate athlete. Brought to a lost valley by his mother and father at a young age, Freelance left to roam the world after the death of his parents and fought for freedom against those who would deny it to others. Freelance was unabashedly patriotic and positive, and his adventures were paced like a bullet. He was like a way for Canadian kids to kind of learn the geography of Europe as the war was going on, because wherever there were Canadians fighting, Freelance would fight with them. He wasn't assigned to a specific battalion, he was a freelance fighter. But, you know, wherever the Canadians were in the thick of it, he would be there doing it for them. And so we could sort of follow our boys overseas through him. His uniform was pretty basic. He had no other real costume characteristics, except for uh, an L on his chest which is pretty funny because that kind of gives it away and there's not really anything else hiding your identity. He's got to be pretty confident that nobody's really going to put two and two together. The explosion and popularity of Canadian superhero stories during 1941 and 42 was so strong, neither Maple Leaf nor Anglo-American could keep up with demand. Other companies quickly jumped into the marketplace, and soon a new wave of characters from Montreal's educational projects hit the shelves. They were very much coming from um, literally an educational point of view, where they had a lot of strips about, hey, Judge Godwin looks at different kinds of jobs you might get when you grow up, and book clubs and things like that. One strip, called Adventures of the RCMP, had a ripped-from-the-headlines sensibility and celebrated all things Canadian. While these true-life inspirational stories may have appealed to parents, educational projects didn't want to lose their main demographic. And soon, a fictional action-seeking character was created who would become one of the most famous superheroes of his era. His name was Canada Jack. Adventurer and athlete, Canada Jack first appeared in Canadian Heroes, Volume 1. Created by George Mendez Ray, Canada Jack was intentionally designed to easily fit into educational projects' aspirational themes that emphasized characters that were more realistic than fantastic. Canada Jack didn't really have any supervillains or enemies or anything. He was helping a kid who had fallen in with the wrong people. And Canada Jack was always engaged in making sure kids got a break. So it was very much speaking to that demographic where he had kids help them and had a real respect for kids. He was always shown doing very achievable physical things like leaping, running, exercising. He was basically like a one-man YMCA. We needed someone to fight on the home front and fight the Axis abroad for the Canadian war effort. And every child liked the idea of a superhero in fighting the Axis. They could even identify with many of our superheroes who were not larger than life, like Canada Jack. It wasn't so much that he was fighting the Axis. He was fighting anyone who was a danger to kids having a proper lifestyle. Canada Jack was incredibly popular. There were Canada Jack clubs, societies. You could sign up in, in the back of the comic book. And there was actual Canada Jack merchandise, which then was actually incredibly rare. I think the reason why Canada Jack was so popular was because he was just like everybody else. He was a regular guy, he was experiencing the same difficulties that everybody else was going through, but he forged ahead and he was heroic and he could overcome anything. And kids, and I think adults alike, they really did look up to him. Of the several Canadian publishers from the war years, the most famous was Bell Features. A combination of artist Adrian Dingle's Hillsborough Studios and Cy Bell's Commercial Science Company, Bell Features quickly became a powerhouse in the superhero field with the launch of Triumph Comics. One of the nice things about Triumph Comics was that when you look at the artwork inside them, it almost had a, a different style than most comics did. It was very painterly, very illustrative, very lyrical, not cartoony. One of the other things Triumph Comics did was that it launched Canada's most famous female superhero, Nelvana of the Northern Lights. Created by Adrian Dingle and first appearing during the summer of 1941, Nelvana has become one of the most well-known and most enduring of all Canadian comic book superheroes. 
she beat Wonder Woman to the stand by months, and she was very uh, a powerful character in her own right. The daughter of Koliak the Mighty, Nelvana was a northern goddess who had the ability to harness the power of the northern lights to travel at great speeds and to command the skies. She was often aided by her brother Tenero, who was able to take the appearance of a great dame to help Nelvana on her many adventures. I suspect there must have been a great Dane in Adrian Dingle's life, because I'm not sure how many great Danes were actually native to, to the Arctic at the time. Starting as an action-adventure series, Nelvana's storyline eventually veered into science fiction when she visited a world under the Arctic and later fought interdimensional invaders. There's a couple of things that make Nelvana special. Uh, first of all is her pedigree. One of her co-creators, Franz Johnston, was a member of the Group of Seven, and you don't get any more Canadian than that. And a lot of that energy comes through in the Canadian superhero. Uh, so many of our characters are rooted in the wilderness, in the north, in the landscape. And Nelvana is no exception. She's Nelvana of the Northern Lights. The weird thing about Nelvana, of course, is that she's putatively uh, based in Inuit mythology, but uh, to make her, I guess, palatable for the child audience, they turned her into a white woman in a miniskirt. Ultimately, Nelvana was a very iconic, powerful woman superhero, taking names, kicking butt, and never relying on a man to save her. She was always leading her own adventures and very much a take charge kind of character. Most experts see Nelvana as the leading Canadian superhero of the war years, a popularity that endures today. Once Adrian Ningle's company merged with Bell and Adrian took over the art directing, something interesting happens a few issues later where some of the artists that we associate with Triumph and some of the other books disappear. Partially because Bell expanded so quickly, suddenly he was putting out five or six books all at once, so they needed more art to fill those books. But I also wonder if some of the artists weren't called up to war and had to be replaced because Bell easily had the youngest overall art staff of any of the companies. With many of the older, more established artists now serving in the military, younger artists were given the chance to show their artistic talents. Often as young as 16, they drew the comics they wanted to read. A unique mix of superheroes, slam-bam action, and exotic adventures outside Canada. One of the last surviving Whites artists is Montreal native Jack Tremblay, who at 15 became one of Bell Feature's youngest employees. His early work influenced his son, Rick Trembles, and today both are acclaimed visual artists. I was uh, struck by comics when I was about 10 years old, reading them Sunday funnies, and I promised that someday I'd be a comic book artist. With an older brother serving in the Royal Canadian Air Force in Europe, young Jack was very interested in the war and what was happening in the skies over Germany. He created Crash Carson as a tribute to his brother. Bell features, they had a page and the last frame was missing. And they said, finish this comic page. It's a contest, you know? So I finished it and that's where I won. So what I got was a pair of roller skates. But then I kept doing comics, and I said, what the hell, you know? I got this thing, I call it Crash Carson, why don't I send it in, you know? I'll finish it, hurry up and finish it, send it in. I sent it in and they accepted, that's what, that's how it happened. Crash Carson. <laughs> you don't have the first, to, to turn the page. Well, it's, it the, might the be first, too The first page see. is, and it was two colors, eh? Oh, that first page. I'm looking, I'm looking. I haven't seen it for so long. Here we go. Wait, 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 okay, wait, 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 wait. Careful, careful, you're going to tear it. Ooh, careful. Here. That's the a, that's a first spread. I did that m long before I was ever involved. How in old were you when you drew this? I was 15 when I did that. So you sent it in uh, I, unsolicited? You just well, sent it, it was, in the finished it was thing? I was 16 when it was published, but I, I did it at 15. Did they know it was coming, or did you just send them no, that? No, no, I sent them after. After uh, uh, I won the pool, roller skates. Oh, okay. I, so they I knew sent, who you sent, were from. I sent this. Okay, great. And they said, we buy. Fantastic. Still living at home, young Jack drew comics for Bell Features and mailed them to Toronto and waited to see if they'd show up in the next issue at his local store. Instead of phoning, they would send me a telegram. All right, when are you going to be through, you know? The pressure was on. 
So that was it. How would they pay you? Would it be cash or they'd send a check? Uh, I used to get a check. For $3 a page, 10 pages with $30, and I thought it was a lot of money in for, for, uh, for a month. A good amount of uh, cash back then. Oh, yeah, sure. What, what ended up with all uh, that money? You wouldn't believe this. I gave, half, I gave half to my parents as my rent, you know? At 16. So, yeah. Paying rent at 16. <laughs> well, they could use it in those days. Yeah, oh, for yeah. sure, yeah. Jack's stories were read by kids from across Canada, and it wasn't long before he became known in the schoolyard for his comic book artwork. I was a little uh, nervous about that. I'd, I'd walk down the street and, you know, somebody said, hi, Jack, you know, well, what's coming next month and stuff? You know, at 15, you're not quite ready for that. That was my little taste of, of fame. And you've been hooked ever since? Yeah, on fame, yeah, sure. Jack drew for Bell Features for two and a half years, but as soon as he was old enough, he enlisted in the army so he could fight the Nazis with his older brother. I wanted to be part of it, not just draw it, you know? Let's be part of it. Oh, so you joined the armed forces and that's when you left your action comics number one and the first Batman. Yes, yes, and then when, when I came back, it was gone. Well, what happened to it? Well, I, like I said, my, my kid brother traitored it. Oh. Of all the superheroes of the war years, perhaps no one is more synonymous with the image of Canada than the iconic character of Johnny Canuck. Well, he was a two-fisted, heroic pilot who looked almost exactly like his creator, Leo Batchel. Leo put himself into the comic and pretty early on had uh, Johnny Canuck fighting Hitler and giving him a sock to the nose, just like young Leo wanted to do. Often described as the Canadian version of Captain America, Johnny Canuck didn't have any special or supernatural powers. Instead, he relied on pure athleticism to defeat evil. He remains one of the most well-known representations of Canada during the war years. Followed by Canadian kids at home and by soldiers overseas, Johnny Canuck's adventures spanned the globe. His superpower, if you recall, was being Canadian. I really like that. That whenever, whenever he would rip his shirt off and you'd see his glistening muscles, they'd always say, and the, the beating heart of a Canadian fighting man. And that was kind of his power, that he ate syrup and bacon or something, and this allowed him to punch out Nazis. And because around the world, the name Johnny Canuck stuck as a nickname for Canadian soldiers, you have to give him points for being the one the world thinks of first. In the summer of 1945, the Second World War ended and the soldiers started coming home. The need to reinforce Canadian values and patriotism through our own superheroes was over. And with the repeal of the War Conservation Act, Canadian comic book publishers and artists soon found themselves facing a range of new challenges. All the companies knew they would have to compete with the colorful American comics that the kids had lost years before. And being black and white wouldn't cut it. Several of the companies tried to convert to color, but unfortunately, even as they lifted the ban on magazines and periodicals coming into Canada, there was another limit on the actual amount of paper most publishers were allowed to get, and the writing was on the wall for all of the Canadian companies. Nothing was the same after that. They just couldn't compete. They didn't have the ability to really manufacture comics that looked as good as the Americans. And the Americans had the famous faces. They had Batman, Wonder Woman, uh, Superman. So they won. When the Canadian Whites stopped, there's a loss there because all the cartoonists who'd been doing such beautiful work were suddenly unemployed because the American comics were back. So for them to keep working, they either had to go to the States, which means they weren't Canadian anymore, or they had to stop making comics, which meant they weren't cartoonists anymore. So we lost our generation of Canadian cartoonists when that happened. Within a year of the end of the war, most of the Canadian publishers folded. Bell Features was sold to a printing company, Maple Leaf and Educational Projects shut their doors, and after making some inroads in the United States, Anglo-American folded, and the golden age of Canadian comic book superheroes was over. It would be decades before another Canadian superhero was born. In the years following the Second World War, there were no new Canadian comic book superheroes. But by the late 1960s, things were about to change. In 1968, a young Pierre Trudeau became the new Prime Minister of Canada. Redefining Canada on the world stage, 
Trudeau thumbed his nose at Richard Nixon, made friends with Fidel Castro, and charted a new path for Canada that wasn't beholden to anyone but ourselves. In music, literature, and the arts, Canadians were making their mark in the world like never before. And for many, it was a proud time to be a Canadian. But creating and sustaining our own superheroes remained elusive. American heroes were going strong, and a whole generation was brought up with them. With Canada starting to come into its own, and amid this newfound patriotism, came a surprising resurgence of interest in our forgotten pop culture history. The Canadian Whites did not come on my scene until I got very interested in the Toronto comic book scene. And I thought everybody was sort of my age, and you know, then I ran into a guy called Harold Town, who was a very well-known artist, and we were chatting, and I had a comic book pin, and he went, oh, I used to draw comics. It was published by some people on John Street, but he, he gave me some names, he told me about freelance, he told me about uh, a number of comics, and of course, I then got interested in it. And then right about that time, a book came out called The Great Canadian Comic Book. Written by Michael Hirsch and Patrick Lubert, and illustrated by Clive Smith, The Great Canadian Comic Books was instrumental in sparking a wave of renewed interest in our nation's comic book history. Well, the first time that I ran into a Canadian comic book was in my pursuit of the Canadian Whites. I frequented Captain George's store on Markham Street and I would go rummage through their stuff looking for, you know, the various comics, either DC or Marvel or others that I was interested in, but also found his Canadian Whites. And it was that connection to the Whites that really drew me to find out more about them. Michael Hirsch's conversations with Captain George led him to a Whites legend, John Ezrin, part owner of Bell Features. He met with us a few times, and over a short period of time, he decided that he liked us. And so he made us a proposal to buy his collection. And we said, well, how, how much are you going to charge us? And he said, well, uh, $10,000, right? $10,000. He might as well have said $100,000, right? And Michael and I are like, yeah, but, you know. No, he said, no, you'll, you'll do this. You're doers. We got a guarantee from Patrick Lubert's father, also Patrick and uh, he guaranteed our loan at the bank and we were able to borrow the money from the bank to pay John Ezra. As a foray into the Canadian Whites, I was doing some work at the time for CBC Drop-In, which was a children's show, and I offered the story of the Canadian Whites to them as a 10-minute sort of uh, fill and um, went in pursuit of some of the authors. John had no idea where they were, so we actually telephoned around and used his contacts and our contacts and found most of the artists, you just starting from their names in the comic books, and interviewed them for the telescope, which was, which was really a kick. I mean, uh, all these guys were, were so happy that somebody found them, right, and interviewed them, and their stories were great. They were just kids, you know. The deal that sort of got us our money back was a deal where we sold a couple of full collections to the National Gallery. The National Gallery was very interested in the material and took a lot of the material and paid us for it and then we created a traveling show for them and we had this huge wealth of artwork and comic books. You know, we were able to create something that would go across the country and we created some out of the comic books. We'd take a page which had said, create this at home, kids. You can create this out of two balloons and a, and a cutout. And so we did giant versions of those, right? So, so almost everything in, in the show was derived out of, out of the comic books. The traveling show that we did went across Canada for about two years. When it was local, I would go with it and do a little bit of a Q&A. The attendance was pretty good and people were curious and really interested and were surprised that these comic books were even around because a lot of people didn't know of their existence. So I think we were, we were um, you know, it was good that we, that we did it. Across the country, the Traveling Whites Roadshow was a tremendous success with crowds flocking to see a glimpse of our nation's comic book legacy. As the new owners of many of the Whites era characters, Michael Hirsch, Patrick Lubert, and Clive Smith formed Nelvana Studios, taking their name from Nelvana of the Northern Lights. The decision to the National Gallery was really what 
financed our ability to pay John. Otherwise, we could have never come up with the $10,000. And he was very interested that it had been the National Gallery that had financed it finally. He said, so these are going in, a, in an art gallery? I said, yeah, they're very interested, John. He said, that's great. You guys have done well, you know, so. He said, and now I, I don't have to carry it around anymore. So I think John wanted it gone. And, uh, you know, so we were the beneficiary of those. We were lucky. With the country's first look at its original superheroes since the Second World War, it was time for a new generation of Canadian heroes to be born. Part superhero and part secret agent, Captain Canuck burst onto the scene in the summer of 1975. An instant hit, Canuck's popularity surprised everyone. Captain Canuck began in Winnipeg, Manitoba uh, when I met Ron Leishman. Ron Leishman actually attended Red River Community College around the same time. And he suggested to me one day, there should be a Canadian superhero. He had a sketch. We didn't have a name yet, but Captain Canada seemed to be the obvious choice. We ended up with Captain Canuck. I was able to make a deal with a printer. I, I borrowed some money. I'd lined up a distributor. In those days, it was just basically a newsstand distributor. There were no comic shops yet. And um, away we went. It came out in um, May of 75, and um, reception was beyond my perception of what it might be. It was first item on the national news, it was in every newspaper. And you know that, that this is good and you know you want to ride it. It's like tons of free advertising and, uh, and, and sales were really good. I mean, stores were selling out like crazy. The first time that I ran across a comic that I knew was, you know, a Canadian comic was during the media blitz that was Captain Canuck. I mean, every radio station, every TV show had something about Captain Canuck. It was a very, very big deal. I remember the first time I saw Captain Canuck, I had my allowance, driven up from my bike, new stand sitting right there, Hey Kids comics written across the top of it. The top row was a Batman comic, the one next to it was a Spider-Man comic, and there right underneath it was Captain Canuck. Orange color in the background, Captain Canuck standing in the middle, bright letters for Captain Canuck, and I, I literally took a step back and went, what the heck is this? <laughs> and started flipping through it with the friend of mine that was with me, and I bought it that day. I was not uh, a big fan of the comic. I didn't like the color in particular and it felt weird and it was more expensive than the other comics. But it wasn't until I did buy one. This is, that's, the, that's the mark of a comic book nerd. I did buy the first issue, actually the first eight issues. This is a book that went on the newsstand opposite the DC books, opposite the Marvel books and sold and people bought it. It meant something to a Canadian kid to go, holy cow, this is mine. This is me. People just loved it, lined up at the bay for like hours to buy issues of Captain Canuck and have them signed. And, and it wasn't really about the comic. It wasn't really about the hero. It was about Canada and showing your love for the country. The thing that really turned me on was it was actually published in Canada. Because up till then, it really had been Marvel and DC and Dell and a few other publishers. But to see a Canadian address and to say, you know, right to blah, 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 Winnipeg, you're like, really? That's wild. The first issue had a double page ad enticing readers to join the Captain Canuck fan club. For $3.50, members got a t-shirt, a sewable patch, colored poster, a membership card, and a 10% discount on their Captain Canuck subscription. Thousands signed up. One kid said, well, we, we got our own baseball team, now we got our own superhero, now, and now it feels like a real country, you know what I mean? Those are the kind of comments that came from kids. Later on, they kind of upgraded the membership kit too, and you'd see kids walking around with Captain Canuck t-shirts, and you know that they mailed away for them, and you wouldn't have to worry if it was crossing the border, and you wouldn't have to worry about it taking four months to get back to you, if it did at all, and you wouldn't have to worry about getting American money from an uncle or an aunt or something, so you could send it away to get it. The fact that this was all something that was in our hands, that we could access, and that we could respond to, was very important to us. Naivety is a, a beautiful thing, uh, because if, you would, if I would have known everything, I probably would have said, no way, I'm not going to walk into this venture, but uh, I think a lot of Canadians felt, yes, this is what we should have. 
why didn't we have this a long time ago kind of thing, you know what I mean? Set decades in the future, in a time when Canada was a superpower because of its vast natural resources, the first issues of Captain Canuck were a mixture of science fiction and action adventure. Back in 75, when I was writing Captain Canuck, I wanted to set the stories in the future so that, you know, we'd have some liberty with story elements. So I said, let's make it in a pretty far future, 1993. Boy, that seems far enough. And yeah, of course I wanted Canada to be even more powerful than it already was because I wanted Captain Canuck to be protecting something even more important than what existed then in 1975. In order to serve and protect Canada, Richard Cumley devised a way for Tom Evans to become Captain Canuck. The origin story is he's been affected by aliens. He doesn't even know it himself. He's on a camping trip with his scout patrol. He's a scout leader. Aliens come down and do what aliens like to do with human species to examine him. They zap him with some rays, you know, and, and uh, they go. And they, of course they erase their memories, as aliens always do, as we all know. But in the beginning, he's working for a government agency, sort of the precursor to CSIS. I call it CISO. And he had uh, been conscripted from the RCMP into CISO. He came back from this scouting trip and all of a sudden he's twice as strong as any other agent. And wheels start churning with some of the head cheeses and uh, they say, why don't we come up with a costume and a code name and he can represent Canada and he can represent CISO and especially when we're going against international terrorists. Tapping into the national tension between Quebec separatists and the rest of Canada, Comley tried to contemporize Captain Canuck by creating the characters of Quebec and Redcoat. This is my attempt to bring the country together. I just felt somehow the, the unity between those three agents could kind of represent the unity I envision Canada having. Having drawn, written, and published the first issue of Captain Canuck on his own, Richard Cumley realized the comic's artwork needed to be stronger. Help soon came in the form of a young artist named George Freeman. I knew I needed help, you know what I mean? It was just too much. I was doing everything, selling the ads, handling distribution, publicity, you name it. I, I had to do everything. I was a one-man show, and uh, he helped me finish the coloring for issue number two. Then he did the inking for number three, and then he did pencils and inking for number four. Soon after George Freeman's arrival, another talented young artist arrived on Cumley's Winnipeg doorstep. His name was Claude Saint-Aubin, and he had come all the way from Montreal to be part of Captain Canuck. He knew maybe 20 words of English, and I said, okay. And yeah, it was a lot of fun, especially when we did the issues where I wanted some French. I had Claude right there. Okay, Claude, we want, I want to do this in English, and I want some French in there, and he provided the translation. And yes, it really, I, I really think that they, they were almost like godsends to me. Even with George Freeman's and Claude Saint-Aubin's assistance, Publishing Captain Canuck remained a formidable logistical challenge. One of the, the challenges with Captain Canuck is the size of the market. To successfully produce a comic book series that primarily, whose primary market is Canada is difficult financially. First of all, my printing costs were much higher because I had it printed in Canada. And I was printing too many copies, too, for the distribution system. I was printing 200,000 copies because the distributor really didn't know how many to put out there. We used better quality paper in it, for example, so that also increased the price. And so I put a 35 cent cover price on it, and at that time, all the other comic books were 25 cents. At the time, Captain Canuck was one of the very few independently produced full-color superhero comics in North America. And in fact, Marvel and DC very quickly followed. Despite the higher price, a regular printing run was nearly impossible to sustain. I had run out of money, I'd used up all my credit, and Claude and I went to work as commercial artists for other companies for a while. George went back to Winnipeg and, and continued his uh, commercial art work career there. And then in 78, I was able to find uh, a couple of investors and, and get going again. With issue number four, we started printing in the States. We realized 
you know, in order to survive, we've got to print where everybody else is printing. We've got to take advantage of that lower price down there. We eventually got an American distributor who also handled Canada. The Captain Canuck reboot showed initial promise, but once again, high printing and crippling distribution costs forced it to fold after only 14 issues. Further attempts to resurrect the iconic superhero in the 1990s shared a similar fate. It seems like every decade there's a new Captain Canuck comic, and I, I, I like that consistency because it, it really helps the profile of Captain Canuck. It really keeps promoting Canadian comics, it, it, even if it's just a little bit. And uh, I, I think that Canada needs that, that kind of figure constantly, you know, constantly trying. Everybody knows about him, and hopefully everybody will still know about him, and maybe his runs will be a little bit longer and, you know, more popular in the future. There was a lot of media interest in bringing him back. I think Captain Canuck is always of interest to Canadians and Canadian media. I think it, he still is. There are characters out there that will never ever totally die, and Captain Canuck's one of them. Created by Len Wein, John Romita Sr. and Herb Tramp in 1974, and first appearing in issue 180 of The Incredible Hulk, Wolverine has gone on to become one of the world's most popular superheroes. My favorite superhero is probably Wolverine, and I hate to say it's because he's popular, but all Canadians have this small sense of inferiority because we sleep next to the giant downstairs. And because Wolverine is accepted around the world and everybody knows who he is, a part of me gets to go, he's my favorite because he's more famous than your superhero is. And I kind of like that because uh, it, it allows us Canadians to have a little bit of pride. Despite being born in Alberta, fighting for Canada in the First World War, and parachuting into France on D-Day with the Canadian Parachute Battalion, Wolverine is often mistaken as an American superhero. Unlike many of his predecessors, and far from being the typically polite and mild-mannered Canadian, Wolverine is more of an authority-defying, maverick, anti-hero. Wolverine is the original badass. Wolverine is probably the only Canadian superhero that mainstream fans actually care about or know about, probably because he's the least Canadianized. He's a transplant. I mean, we're all proud of him here in Canada because he made good, but he's more universal. He's more owned by the world than most Canadian superheroes are. I think Wolverine is one of the better representations of uh, Canadians uh, and Canadian superheroes because he's really gruff and manly and kind of like a lumberjack. And I, those attributes are good and bad. I mean, in some ways, I think it makes him a little bit foolish, like a little bit more like a caricature, but in other ways, I think, you know, he is unpolished and so he's not glamorous and he's not flashy and, and that's what I kind of like as a representation of, you know, Canadians. Created during the last years of the Vietnam War and in the aftermath of the rebellious 60s, Wolverine is one of the most popular anti-heroes in the history of comics. Unstable and prone to unpredictable outbursts of anger and rage, Wolverine is often as violent and horrific as his adversaries. I would argue that Wolverine's popularity goes back to that basic psychological thing, which is that he doesn't have to put up with you. He doesn't have to quietly take it. As soon as something goes wrong, he just pulls out the claws and starts hacking at stuff. And I think that's the secret hidden agenda of almost everybody, that we all wish we could solve the problem just by being aggressive until it goes away. We all relate to the unrestrained id. We all wish we could have our lizard brains in charge of us, but we can't. Wolverine does kind of have this Canadian angle to him, which is very authentic, of the ruggedness of Canada, the wilderness of Canada. Canada is a country where you have to fight to survive. So a Canadian superhero, to me, has to speak to those qualities. Canadian in origin, but American in attitude, Wolverine was nurtured by then-Canadian John Byrne and American Chris Claremont in the X-Men comic books, and is, to some, the definitive Canadian superhero. Definitive is a funny word. Um, I don't know that Wolverine is the definitive Canadian superhero. To be honest, I don't think we've come to that sort of consensus, but he is certainly my favorite Canadian superhero, because Wolverine is a character that inherently is a mystery. 
We know that he has something to do with Mount Logan. His name is Logan. We know that he was involved with Canadian spies, but we're not really quite sure. And when I was reading the comic in the 70s, how old was he? Was he 60? Oh my God, that would make him, he could have fought in World War II. He's got this healing power so he can heal, so he doesn't have to necessarily be the age of the other X-Men. So he becomes this very enigmatic character. And if you're a Canadian, you've never figured out what the Canadian identity is. I, I don't know about you, but I haven't been able to figure it out. So I love the fact that Wolverine, you looked at him and he was enigmatic too. Also, there's this balance between the berserker rage and the sort of Zen kind of peace that that character has. He's trying to be very quiet. He's studying martial arts. He's obviously been to Japan. He speaks about seven languages, including Japanese. He's very cosmopolitan. But you look at him and he's a hairy guy who likes to hang out in bars and drink beer and wear plaid shirts, you know, <laughs> You're, you know, and, but he doesn't look like what he is, which is one of the very Canadian parts of it. And I remember the first time I read the X-Men comic where he popped the claws and he wasn't wearing the gauntlet, so you realize that those claws were his body. It was mind-blowing as a young comic book reader. It was, he, again, he was just full of mystery. A number of years ago, I think they took a poll as to what Canada's identity was. And I think the answer was as Canadian as possible under the circumstances. So I think the quintessential Canadian superhero is someone who doesn't mind being almost American looking as long as you know he's not. Which I think is why Wolverine is perfect. He's aggressive like an American or like a Canadian hockey player, but at the same time, he knows in his heart he's Canadian and he knows the difference. The enduring popularity of Wolverine stems in large part to how easily identifiable comic book readers find him. He's literally done it all. I mean, he's gone down to hell and been possessed by demons. He's been married. He's had a kid who ended up hating him. He ended up having some daddy issues. He was betrayed by his government. He had a bunch of different storylines of love lost, and he joined the X-Men, joined a bunch of other super teams. He was on Alpha Flight for a while, started the Jean Grey School. You know, he's done a lot. Created by John Byrne in 1979 and first appearing in Uncanny X-Men, Alpha Flight was the first Canadian superhero team in the Marvel comic book universe and is often described as Canada's answer to the Avengers. A lot of the characters were developed by John Byrne when he was an art student in Calgary. And uh, when he went to work for Marvel, he hooked up with uh, the writer Chris Claremont and uh, was brought in to illustrate the X-Men comic. While he was on the X-Men, uh, he had a lot of success in making Wolverine one of the most popular characters on the team, and they wanted to introduce a backstory to Wolverine that hadn't been seen before. So uh, they introduced this whole Department H where he'd been working for the government and secretly trained, and they said, well, if you know, he was working for the government, maybe there are other Canadian superheroes. I was actually in Calgary and I actually knew where John Byrne hung out. And that story that he did, the two-parter, is set in Calgary and his friends are in it. So I read it and I thought, oh, this is great. This is a love letter to Canadian heroes in the body of, at that time, the most impressive, most interesting superhero comic in the world. The X-Men in the 70s, they were it. And there was a Canadian team. I, I, it was just great. And then those characters largely disappeared. After finding success at Marvel with Wolverine and the X-Men, John Byrne was offered the chance to create a new superhero team, which eventually became Alpha Flight. When the first issue sold over half a million copies in North America alone, Alpha Flight was a breakout hit. But reaction north of the border was polarized. I think my reaction to Alpha Flight was akin to my reaction to Captain Canuck. I didn't like the comic. Again, they, it didn't reflect back to me what felt Canadian, but I liked the tie-in that it was a Canadian government kind of backed agency and of superheroes, and I liked that idea because in Canada, that's what we would do. <laughs> and Pierre Trudeau shows up in one of the issues, so come on, that's pretty funny. And the fact that it was done by a Canadian, I mean, there is a lot of charm to those 
early issues of Alpha Flight. Despite being an instant hit, the world's newest superhero team perpetuated many of the images and stereotypes Canada was known for. From British Columbia, Sasquatch was the obligatory big and strong character, similar to the Hulk. London, Ontario's Guardian, Produce Energy, and was Canada's answer to Captain America. French-Canadian North Star harnessed the power of speed and light, as does his twin sister, Aurora. Shaman was a First Nations medicine man from Alberta who had the mystical powers of a sorcerer. And Snowbird was an Inuit demigoddess from the North who can transform herself into animals from Canada's Arctic regions. The daughter of Nelvana, she's loosely based on the famous White Sarah Nelvana of the Northern Lights. The team was later joined by Mariana, an amphibian from Newfoundland, and Puck, a vertically challenged saloon bouncer from Saskatoon. I'm shocked we didn't end up with the beaver or maple syrup man in Alpha Flight because, because some of them were really, really silly names. Alpha Flight was created for an American market and Americans don't really understand that we're a diverse melting pot culture that is nothing like the rest of the world sees us. We're all just bacon eating French speaking Eskimos up here. So when they created Alpha Flight, they had to make it for a market that was going to consume this. So they over Canadized it, I guess would be a nice way of saying it. The team's diversity eventually led to North Star becoming the world's first openly gay mainstream superhero. Well, the sad part is that he was the world's first mainstream gay superhero, but we were not allowed to know for 15 years. So his Canadianness was that he wasn't going to be in your face about being gay. If an American character was gay, his first words out of his mouth would be, I'm gay! Whereas this Canadian character is, I'm gay, but you don't need to know. And you know, for something like 20 years after he came out, he did not touch or kiss a man in comics. It was a rule that he was a comics gay character, but he had to be chaste and pure as Snow White. After keeping his sexuality a secret for decades, once out, it was only a matter of time before North Star got married. And when it finally happened, this groundbreaking comic book storyline made news around the world. I think North Star's wedding was very positive, but you also got to remember it was very recent. So I'm very happy that after years and years of him living in the closet in a chastity belt, he finally gets to get out and meet somebody. And it's very nice that when they finally married him off, they married him interracially too, so that you, you end up just, one's mutant, one's human. <laughs> Didn't think I was going there. Despite a multi-year run and wide-ranging popularity, Alpha Flight was canceled after 130 issues. Much like the various efforts to reboot Captain Canuck, attempts to relaunch Alpha Flight in 1997 and 2004 were unsuccessful. The most recent reboot of Alpha Flight was launched by Marvel in 2011, to great fanfare with solid sales in both Canada and the United States. Written by Americans Fred Van Lente and Greg Pak, and penciled by Canadian Dale Eaglesham, the new Alpha Flight relaunched the dormant Marvel property to a new generation of readers. Our big crazy high concept is what if their country goes crazy? You know, what if their government turns on them? And in this case, we, you know, the, the big what if is what if Canada went fascist? I mean, the fun thing about it too was that from a, the outside world, the, the stereotype of Canadians is, you know, mild-mannered and, and polite. And so if we could make fascism convincing in Canada, we'd, we'd really be telling a good story, I think. We were completely saved by the fact that our artist is Canadian. I just finished a, a run on Hulk and they, they had finally received a pitch for Alpha Flight that they liked and, and they started looking for an artist and they wanted a Canadian on the book and I was the only guy standing there who was Canadian and I felt pretty ecstatic doing it because I, I, I was obviously reading some of those back when they came out in the 80s and they're really unique but John Byrne created uh, a lot of backstory for each one that he never really fully tapped. So as an artist, I'm, I'm like, there's so much to work with here. Alpha Flight is one of those almost legendary comic book properties. It's a property everybody loves, but it's been tricky to find the right hook to, uh, to, to maintain the series. It is a group of patriotic superheroes in the sense that they represent their country. They literally represent their country. So it's like a team of Captain Americans, right? But when you have Captain America, it's just Cap, and he sort of embodies everything. When you have Alpha Flight, you have a bunch of different people in a, in a, in a kind of surprisingly and interestingly diverse team, and that's a very interesting way to represent a country. Very simply, it puts Canada in the Marvel Universe, and really there is no other Canadian group of superheroes at Marvel or DC or anywhere, and uh, you know, 
I think just seeing Vancouver, Montreal, or Ottawa in a comic book is, is original enough as far as I'm concerned, and you, you can't get that anywhere else. In comics, we talk a lot about silhouettes. And when you have a team of heroes, it's particularly you know, important or interesting to have a variety of silhouettes. And Alpha Flight, I mean, Byrne, he has this kind of just fresh, clean style, art style, that um, is just immediately compelling. There's, there's something also that I only noticed this year, which is ridiculous, but you know, they've got the maple leaf on uh, Guardian who is, and, and Vindicator. But a lot of the other costumes have a similar kind of starburst design to them. It's fairly subtle, but it holds them together. They're really unique, they're really different, they stand out. These are not ultra cool superheroes, they're, they're a little goofy, and yet there's, you know, like Aurora, there's a dark side to them. So that's kind of what really makes them stand out. And for the fans, it's really just something different, a totally different perspective, which is very Canadian, you know. Despite initial promise, the 2011 reboot of Alpha Flight was ultimately not financially sustainable, and Marvel cancelled the series after only eight issues. The reality of mainstream superhero publishing is you have to have wide appeal. And uh, I think when you get into politics and nationalism, even though most of the American superheroes are based in American cities and so forth, I don't think that's an element of the strip. Something like Alpha Flight, Canada's front and center. And I don't think that has that appeal. I don't think Canadians want to see themselves in the comics. They want super and, and for some reason, Canadians can't reconcile super and Canadian together. It just, they just don't really see it. They do, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like a natural thing to them, which is hilarious. Alpha Flight is a difficult concept to rebound because it came out of a period in Canadian history where there was a certain amount of charm there and the characters weren't clearly enough defined to really be able to keep going. You know, these sort of arbitrariness that started to happen to some of those heroes, or we don't like that character, so we'll kill that character off. The Alpha Flight team at one period just became, well, let's just try this and see what happens, which doesn't make for great continuity. I think what really at some point would have to happen is a very good Canadian writer would have to team up with a very good Canadian artist, and they'd need to reconfigure the team. But I don't see why you would do that economically. I, I don't see the drive. Canada entered a dark time in its quest to create a bona fide and sustainable superhero. By the 1990s, the Cold War was over, Quebec nationalism had waned, and Canada was seen as a peaceful nation known more for mediating conflicts than starting them. Rather than try their luck in Canada, talented newcomers like Todd McFarlane went south to work in the US. But it was only a matter of time before someone back home would try to create the next generation of Canadian superheroes. My name is Charles Alfred Newman. I am the sole survivor of the Canadian Soldier Enhancement Program, better known as the Moncton Experiments. Heroes of the North is a recent superhero web series that was an important first step toward reviving the Canadian superhero genre. I've always been reading comics. I've always been curious about the fact that we almost had an industry because, you know, the, the Golden Age Canadian comics, they were popular. And then for some reason, and which I think is typically Canadian, as soon as the American came back in the market, all right, let's drop it. Like, we could have continued. I don't understand why they dropped everything. And then it, it kind of resurfaced a little bit in the 70s. Because I wanted, when I was a kid, I was, I was growing in French Quebec and Rivière de Luce was very far from anything anglophone. But, and before that, I was living in Labrador. But that's how, that's how I saw a Captain Canada. The Richard Comey stuff. Yeah. And I thought it was kind of a ripoff of Captain America in a way, but at the same time, it was at least it was Canadian. But it was the image always fascinated me, and I said, uh, yeah, we want to do something about that one day, do a Canadian superhero, it'd be cool. After making a popular low budget science fiction film called Recon 2022, director Christian Vale had ambitious plans for a sequel. But the recession of 2008 put his plans on hold, so he and his team decided to create a Canadian superhero web series using the latest in digital technology. We just slowly started thinking about marrying the concept of the Avengers and, say, Watchmen, the grittiness of that, and a few other comics mashed together to get this World War II kind of iconic hero vibe. 
the captain, but our own version of, you know, this Canadian thing with Devil's Brigade and secret laboratory experiments for super soldiers and stuff. Following a series of characters drawn from across Canada, including the Canadian, Fleur de Lis, and Nordique, the series was primarily shot at night and on weekends. Crew members did multiple jobs from writing and acting to directing and special effects. The result was an instantaneous and at times controversial hit web series. Vive le Quebec libre! It's funny that we, you know, we just stumbled upon that. I mean, honestly, it was not necessarily a plan, but we wanted to tell something, stories that were close to us with the Newfell kids and stuff like that, talk about the separation in Quebec in, in, in a relaxed way, which created a bit of tension in the beginning when we started because some people didn't like that at all. But overall, you know, we want to talk about our realities, and that's always been the, the plan behind the show. And, and this got, I mean, obviously, superheroes is not realistic, but at the same time, we can still talk about political issues, and, and we use, actually, the Canadian and Fleur de Lis as the, a mirror of the tension between the, sometimes between the two sides, the rest of the, the rock and, and Quebec and all that stuff, and we want to play with that. And that's, I think that's what people react to. It's, it's close to them. They understand. It's more close, you know, you, you have an attachment to it, emotional attachment to it. Feel now? I don't know how you do it in Quebec, but from where I'm from, when somebody saves your ass, you say thank you. So go back to where you came from. Most surprisingly to the creators, their web series has become popular not only in Canada, but around the world. The main traffic is Canadian, of course, but it varies like we're every LT competition with the Americans. A lot of Americans check the show and love the show. And then after that, it's Germany, England. For some reason, tons of traffic all over Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, stuff like that. I have no clue why. <laughs> and a lot of Scandinavians, and then South America too. The international popularity of the Heroes of the North web series soon spawned a series of digital comic books. When we launched, uh, just to explain, to do stuff that we couldn't do live, so we, we just did one comic and it d got downloaded so much the first day that it crashed the server. And then uh, people were like, oh, we want it in print. Well, then we're not, everything was supposed to stay digital, but the demand, like we got getting email, we want to read it and print. We don't like to read it on computer. So we did a small print run and uh, everybody started buying it. I said, okay, well, let's make more comics. So we started making more comics and they keep, people kept buying that. When we released our uh, first book, we got picked up by an American publisher, Arden Entertainment, <laughs> so not a Canadian one, but it got released uh, throughout North America. We sold a lot of books in the US, but uh, tons of books in Canada. It sold out in three weeks. So there is a demand, there's an interest for it. And we went to uh, an American convention, and it was funny because the reaction was mixed. Like we had people, oh, there's no crime in Canada. What do you guys never need superior for, you know? But other people, oh, so cool to finally see a taste of Canada like with a real Canadian angle because a lot of people know about Alpha Flight, obviously, and it's one thing I hated when I was a kid. I was reading Alpha Flight, there's something's happening in Toronto, and you see the Rockies in the background. I'm like, can you do a minimum research, <laughs> like, please? Or when they spoke French, it was French from France with expressions we don't even use. And then I'm like, you know, you're like a, you know, eight hours away from us. I mean, come on, man, <laughs> like make an effort. They have this attitude, much like the Field of Dreams movie. If you build it, they will come. And they started building it before there was an audience, just with the absolute certainty that there was going to be. And I met them in Montreal a couple of years ago and was absolutely infected by their enthusiasm. They were so convinced that they had something that they were going to do well. I wanted to jump on and help them. And it was really because I just loved these guys. I went, you much like the same attitude I had, which was we want to make it ourselves and be damned that we have to import our entertainment. We always take everybody else, culture and stuff. It's ours is like, see, we are kind of ashamed of it. We don't want to talk about it. And I'm, I'm, I was sure, and I'm still sure, but now we know for sure that we're not the only ones taking that because every convention we go, people, thank you for finally doing something Canadian and stuff, and doing something about us. We, we tapped into something. I think there's a nationalistic tendency or something that's not explored in Canadians. We want something that represents us, but nobody's providing it. But it's a big market, and I always knew that because I'm one of them. We're fans, first and foremost. We're, so we're doing something that as fans would do it because we like that stuff. Today at comic book conventions, Canadian creators are front and center, 
attracting fans from around the world for their work. It's pretty weird when it happens, actually. I mean, especially depending on how long you're trying for it. It seems kind of like you're just endlessly sending away samples. That's what you do, you send the samples through the mail. And it was quite a few years later that I got like my actual first job offer from DC Comics. It's surreal, you know? I, I went into this job wanting to draw comics and wanting to draw these characters, but the day you get the call and they say you got the job and you're actually gonna draw some of these characters, it's pretty amazing. And Batman for me is really, you know, it's what I always wanted to do, so I'm really soaking this in as long as I can. I, I never want to come off this book. Despite a large talent pool in Canada, it's inevitable that many of our artists end up working for Marvel, DC, and Dark Horse, creating and drawing American superheroes at the expense of Canadian ones. But unlike previous generations, today's artists don't have to leave the country to make their mark on the world stage. Being Canadian, in terms of how it influences my work, I think uh, what, what it's done is every time I draw a background, you know, living in, in Toronto, it's, it's a very diverse city. And you know, a lot of times when, when I draw characters, I tend to create a more multicultural supporting cast. And I don't think it's a conscious thing to do. It's just that's, that's how it is in Toronto, and that's kind of what I grew up with. What's really very nice about the world today is it's tiny. So all these creators, myself included, we can stay in Canada. We can still work on secondary things that are more passion projects that aren't necessarily the big bucks with the American stuff. And there's a huge support system within Canada. There's something in the water here that makes us want to make comics. Maybe it's because we can't go outdoors during the winter. But something makes us want to do this. The, uh, the best-selling comic book artist of all time is a guy named Todd McFarlane created Spawn and worked on Spider-Man, he's Canadian. Best-selling comic book artist of the 70s was John Byrne, he was Canadian. The best-selling comic book artist of the 40s was Joe Schuster, he was Canadian. It's amazing the percentage of, of the industry that comes from the frozen north. It was never something that occurred to me, uh, something I had to do. Uh, I knew people did it at one point. I never had the motivation to move down to New York or LA or, or San Diego, I mean, uh, my, my idea of going to the big city was going to Toronto, moving there and meeting. And it actually, you know, uh, did help. I mean, I met a great array of artists here who introduced me to their circle. And then by going to a lot of shows in the States, I exposed myself to a variety of different editors and colleagues who then, you know, I wound up getting work with. So, I mean, it never occurred to me as a thing that I had to do, but I, I think it's still done from time to time to help maybe you, help you accelerate. Your, your advancement maybe in the, in the industry. I was a huge John Byrne fan. Anything John Byrne drew, I, I had. I mean, just the way it is, you know? Um, then I found he was Canadian. And then I thought, how cool is that? You know I mean? See, that's why I think it, it became plausible for me to become a comic book artist, where the most popular character there was was a Canadian superhero, Wolverine, and the Canadian guy is drawing this book. Oh, that's cool. So to me, I think I could draw that, I could do that. I'm not thinking that logistically and how difficult it might be for this Canadian kid to actually get a job at Marvel in DC. I didn't think about those things. I thought, hey, it's plausible. Why can't it be done? And I'm doing it from here. I can't, I can't complain. A recent initiative to create the next generation of Canadian superheroes started with the arrival of True Patriot, an anthology collection of new Canadian superheroes drawn by a variety of top artists and creators. True Patriots is a graphic novel anthology spearheaded by Jay Torres. Jay basically contacted a bunch of colleagues he's worked with over the years, friends, uh, fellow illustrators, and asked them to create eight to ten page short story based around creator own Canadian superheroes. Everybody's located in Canada from east coast to west coast and we're all kind of create our own, our own characters. Some of them are more closely tied to Canadian culture perhaps. Like we have a couple of characters based on the Avro Arrow or like the Canadian flag or even the title is kind of based on the anthem. I think we're all having fun with it. We're just trying to create stories for kids for all ages that can enjoy a bit of a Canadian superheroes in their lives. The campaign started as an Indiegogo campaign and we raised the money from fans all over the world to create this collection. I'm not sure if it's they want to see Canadian heroes or if they just like the creators behind them, but I think I think it's it's, it's a good backing. There's constant people tweeting and asking about it, and I'm, they're looking forward to it when it comes out. So, you know, hopefully the reaction is as good as it was for the support when we were building the project. From Nova Scotia-based artist and writer Faith Aaron Hicks comes Superhero Girl. It's just silly gag strips. It's basically about 
a superhero girl. She has no name. Um, she just lives a fairly crappy, somewhat mundane life, fighting crime in a small, unnamed Canadian city. I started doing the comic because I really like the idea of superheroes, but there are not many superhero comics written and drawn with me in mind as a female reader or as someone who's a fan of comedy. So I just started doing my own. Even today, across the country, there are comic book art schools, 24-hour comic book boot camps, and micro labs that incubate artistic talent. And every year, the Schuster Awards celebrate the best in Canadian comic book work. With so many talented artists and creators, it's surprising that someone hasn't yet made the definitive and enduring Canadian superhero. We're a big country with a small population, living next door to the biggest media and cultural empire the world has ever seen. The superhero is a genre that came from somewhere else, and Canadian artists and writers tried to figure out how to make it make sense in their context, in the context of a young country, a country at war, a country that was trying to figure out who it was. They weren't the answer, but they were a way of asking the question. The big impact that it had for me was that I realized this was a forgotten history. I couldn't believe that when I picked up these comics that they had existed and I knew nothing about them. It was like a giant hole in history. And to be honest, it became kind of a, an obsession for me. So when I was managing the Silver Snail, I always tried to make sure that I stocked Canadian comics and I always tried to tell people that these were Canadians. And then when I became a television producer and worked on shows like Prisoners of Gravity, I wanted to say, here's our Canadian artists and our Canadian writers. Because to me, my great fear was that they were gonna be forgotten. And I think that's a shame. You know, popular culture is so ephemeral that this stuff can happen and then disappear. And I don't want that history to be lost. It came and went so fast, it's really, it's really too bad because it was big at the time. You know, instead of buying American comics, kids were buying Canadian comics and they were, they were sort of homegrown uh, superheroes, right? Sound like a familiar Canadian problem? The real problem in Canadian superheroes working economically is we can't get the American audience to care about them. Americans wouldn't buy a Mexican superhero, they're not going to buy a Canadian superhero. They recognize us as the foreign other and they don't really care about us. There's politics involved in creating art. A Canadian themed anything becomes very much only experienced by Canadians. So if you want to get broader, if you want a larger audience, you kind of have to set it somewhere else. And I don't actually think it would make a big difference to set it in Canada, but there is some kind of prejudice there. The realities of the economics of comic book publishing are punishing. We have to accept the fact that comic books are not a mass medium anymore. They were once in the 1940s and 1950s when comic books sold 20 million copies a month. They were a mass medium. They were part of everyday life. They were something that everyone encountered. Today they're not. The superhero certainly is, and the superhero has gone on to dominate television and movies and so on. But the comic book has become an essentially subcultural medium. And when you take a subculture of a narrow market, as unfortunately Canada is, it becomes very difficult to sustain that in the long run. It seems to me that one of the problems with these kind of characters, Captain Newfoundland, Captain Canuck, is they get draped in the flag or they get draped in the name of where they're from. And that's about all that happens. It has worked for Captain America and slightly for Captain Britain, but it hasn't worked in Canada. I would like to see us get away from it having to be quintessentially Canadian. I think we're like really hung up on like whether or not we have a culture in this country. I, I don't need the flag or I don't need any like Canadian -y message on top of it. I just want there to be like a, a Spider-Man for Toronto or a, a Batman for Edmonton. Perhaps our inability to create our own sustainable superhero has more to do with our own identity issues and how we see ourselves than with the mass media and cultural empire next door. We like to imagine ourselves as the peaceable kingdom, as peacekeepers, as negotiators, and yet we try to import that into a genre that's ultimately about solving all of our problems by punching. And so maybe part of why our superheroes aren't sustainable is that you can only avoid punching things for so long in a superhero comic. 
Fundamentally, the superhero is often seen as an outlaw. The individual who makes his own law is an American hero, while the person who works within the law is much more of a Canadian one. I guess the question is, how many superheroes do you need? We have Canadian superheroes, and we have had them for almost as long as there have been superheroes. And if you think about the number of incredibly talented Canadians who have produced superhero comics that aren't explicitly Canadian, you know, we're good at telling superhero stories. We just don't always decide to wrap them in the flag. Today, the legacy of Canada's superheroes lives on at the National Archives in Ottawa, where new generations of comic book fans can find dozens of Canadian superheroes from the pages of history. Here, more than eight decades of Canadian pop culture history and thousands of comics are stored in climate-controlled vaults that are designed to survive fire, floods, and the apocalypse. Ironically, after years of being discarded and nearly forgotten, Canadian comic books are now pristinely preserved for future generations. But where will future Canadian superheroes come from? Right now, there has not been a really definitive Canadian comic book superhero created by a Canadian, kind of focused to Canadians. I think it is possible. I think in many ways it's going to happen, but it will happen because of the internet and it will happen because of some young creator that I don't know is going to do something really awesome. Where that's going to come or how that's going to come, I don't know. But one of the things about the Canadian zeitgeist is that Canadians seem to be very good at understanding what Americans are about. There's something about the way that we see America that at some level I think a Canadian is going to be able to go, okay, I can do that, but two Canadians in a Canadian superhero context. For a country that created the world's first female superhero, the first openly gay superhero, and heroes from our own indigenous people, Canada has been a pioneer in creating diverse characters for more than eight decades. Someday, a Canadian will create the next great comic book superhero. He or she may exist between the pages of a traditional comic book or within a digital one. But with more than 70 years of history and characters to build upon, it's safe to assume that sooner or later, a new hero will be born. After all, a nation is waiting. Well, truthfully, they're kind of for losers, let's face it. Guy, man, bo man, child, lives in his mother's basement, you know. Yeah, not good. Now, my comics are totally different. <laughs> what powers did the perfect Canadian superhero have? Um, That's hard. <laughs> I would probably imbue him with the powers of uh, grace and good government. If he's going to be quintessentially Canadian, his power should be constant helpfulness, really, and politeness, which is what we're known for around the world, and I suppose, and our beer. I would say less powers of politeness and more an ability to infuse politeness in other people. The ideal Canadian superhero should have the ability to survive in the cold. <laughs> I don't know if that's too uh, facetious. The Canadian superhero that I'd be after would be would be Batman -y or something. Like he would, it would be his own ingenuity, and he got there by himself. I'm partial to the big guys. I like, you know, I like the Hulk, Sasquatch, big, strong, you know, and characters. Colossus is my favorite character in comics. I just like those kind of big characters. So I would do something like that, bigger and stronger, black, probably from Toronto. I don't know. <laughs> What do you think? He would have, or she, would have to be able to expand at an incredibly fast rate to the size of the universe at a moment's notice. Why? Because it would be just the most ridiculous thing to do. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs>